the City of Southport Board of Aldermen meeting, April 13th, 2023, is now called to order. Welcome to those in attendance. Thank you for being here. And welcome to those watching virtually. Our invocation this evening will be by Reverend Alderman Lowe Davis, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Let us pray. Almighty, most gracious creator God, we thank you for the blessings of this day, this beautiful spring day here in Southport. The city we love, the city we enjoy, the city we try to serve as best we can. We ask you tonight especially to guide us in our decisions, give us strength, and courage to do the right things and to make the right choices. And keep us always, all of us, ever mindful that in creating us and creating this beautiful world and this beautiful city, you gave us dominion over your creation. And that includes trees. And tonight, as we remember Arbor Day, keep us mindful that every day should be more Arbor Day. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alderman Davis, and yes, every day should be Arbor Day, especially in Southport with our beautiful trees. Before we uh, go to public comment, I would just like to uh, have some opening uh, introductory remarks. I want our citizens to know that the Southport Board of Aldermen were the first board in our area to vote on a resolution in opposition to Senate Bill 317 and other similar bills that remove local authority for planning and zoning by local municipalities. The vote on the resolution in opposition was unanimous. This was at a special call meeting on March 28, 2023. At the direction of the board, I personally delivered this resolution to Senator Bill Rabin and Representative Charles Miller the next day, March 29th, at the legislature in Raleigh. I discussed with them the importance of preserving local municipal authority on planning and zoning. I am proud of this board for their unified, unanimous, and unwavering action in opposition to removing municipal authority over zoning and planning. Since this time, all of the aldermen have either been to Raleigh, talked to our local representatives, or discussed with me their continued opposition to Senate Bill 317 and other bills that hinder local planning and zoning authority. In addition, many of our citizens have called the offices of our elected officials in the legislature and have spoken out against these bills. I applaud their action and all action in this regard. I also want our citizens to know that I spoke with Shalope Mayor Walt Eckerd, shared with him our resolution, and we formed a coalition of local mayors that met with officials from the North Carolina League of Municipalities. And we have written a letter signed by 14 local mayors in collaboration with the League of Municipalities. And it has been sent to Senator Rabin, Representative Miller, and Representative Frank Auer. Also important to note is that the League of Municipalities represents the over 500 cities and towns in North Carolina and is a powerful lobbyist in the legislature on our behalf and for all municipalities. So in multiple ways, our voices have been heard as we continue to work towards preserving our local municipal authority. Also today, Representative Miller and his assistants, Natalie and Madeline, met with the city manager and me this afternoon. We discussed issues facing our city and funding for infrastructure projects. It was a most productive meeting and we appreciate Representative Miller's assistance and support. So thank you for that. 
Item D, public comment. If you please come up to the podium, state your name, address, your topic, and please try to limit it to three minutes. Madam Clerk. I've got Jody Wilmoth. Welcome, Jody. What we're doing in the cemetery. We got rules laid out by the board. We can change them rules, but the board has the final say. And it seems like we got one person that wants to irritate that to death over what we do in the cemetery. Now, who laid out the rules? Who laid out the rules? I couldn't tell you. It come from boards past. But no matter what we decide to do about cemeteries or anything we do, you hire or vote six people in to rule what we do. All you gotta do is put it on a piece of paper, present it at the board, then it's up to the board that you ch so choose in your election as to what we do. As the working class for the town, in order for me to be able to do something for a person that lives in this town, I've got to have work orders for everything we do. That has been determined by the board through us. You can go to either City Hall or Jackie at Public Works and get that work order drawn up. Then it goes to David Kelly, which goes to our hand, which then we can do it. Doesn't matter what the issue is or what you want done. That's the only way technically Public Works can do anything for you, whether it's mowing the grass in front of your house, which is the normal things we do, but David has to give that to us. Once we have a work zone, I'm not allowed to go outside that work zone until David allows me to. And you see my points. If these are little issues we are willing to fight over, what are we gonna do with the bigger issues? That's why we have this board, to talk to, to tell things to, print them on paper, that's all we gotta do. The rules are set in stone in what I have in my hand wrapped in that rubber band. I didn't make them, I just know them. I know where they're laid out in this cemetery. We're not legally bound by the rules that the city has set for city cemeteries, supposed to be cutting anything around a headstone. Where do we, what do we do? Can we change that? Yes. That is allowed to be done, but you have to present it to the board. You can't just say, okay, this is what we're gonna do, keep it the same, that ain't the way this, piece of paper in my hand works. You have to present it at the board meeting, they have to look at it, and then it's up to six people to decide whether we get to do what you want in the cemeteries or not. Does that make sense? And that's pretty much what this board is set for by the town to have a way to do things. Because if I go outside my work zone and I do something for you and your car gets tore up and you turn it in, to the city, then I'm at fault for it. So that's one mark against me. If I get three of those in the same, then they have the right to fire me and I don't wanna get fired for my job. I wanna leave on my own terms, but as citizens, we got to keep that in the back of our mind. These guys are doing the best they can with what you're presenting them. You got to keep that in the back of your mind, people. And in order for public works to work and work in the parameter of the town per se, of course, when we mow, the main thing we're to take care of is from Kingsley Park that way to the end of the long sidewalk that way. That's the priority one over everything else that the mowing crew does. But because of one person wanting to argue over what we do in cemeteries, that's been an issue. It's right here. Anybody wants to read it or look at it, they're welcome to it. And, and I do want input into what we do in the town. There's not an issue about what, as workers, we, we are allowed to do certain things, but there's just certain things like cemeteries, we get, are only allowed to do so much and we have rules for cemeteries. That's what I have not understand why 
I'm working one job. I have to go right across the street over here to this old city hall and do work for the same person that complained about this when all she had to do was go to city hall and get a work order for it. You understand what I'm telling y'all? Public works can do anything for the general public that they want. There's a proper channel between us and you. That's pretty much where I'm going to leave it lie. Does anybody disagree with what I just said? I didn't set the rules. The guys at this table sets the rules. And we have to abide by them whether we like them or not as citizens of the town. I'm with whatever this board decides to do with these cemeteries. But you got to write it down and you got to present it the proper way. If you don't do that and let these guys make the final say, then why do we have rules for anything? I'm not against these guys and I'm not missing. And knowing the parameter of this town is 50 miles of right of ways, three or four parks, and all the cemeteries, three, three of those, full cemetery. That's what we do all summer long for public works. There's six head of guys doing that constant. There's no stopping. That's five days a week, whether you want to or not. And my thing is, if the citizens want to help, cut your grass out to the pavement edge. Just cut it out to the pavement edge. Because the more people do, the less I got to do. And I have no problem putting all my tools up, locking them up, not ever doing that job again. That's what it takes. Working together to solve problems, we don't want to create problems. Because this board ain't here for that. They will end the subject right at the gate. There's nothing wrong with what you want. You just got to, there's a proper etiquette that we do in this town to figure out what we need to do in cemeteries. They want to lease the cemeteries out. How do you do that if you don't know what you're talking about when you get them there? See my point? That's been the issue about Podell Cemetery. Now, my only other thing about the cemetery is the old cemetery on Moore and Red. Even though the city owns it and this is the rules we go by, how do you go by those rules? That's an old cemetery. Does it fall under our rules or historical rules? That's another issue all about cemeteries. Do you understand where I'm going with that? So we got to work on things. And I have no problem showing this to anybody that wants to see it. And I'll show you at the cemetery because I know how this lays out at the cemetery. That's anybody wants to know. And we'll start there and we'll work through all of them and figure out what we need to do to fix this. I'm willing to put my time in. What's the rest of you willing to do? Thank you, Jody. Excellent. Mm. Well, we have a, a cemetery committee, uh, Jody, and, and your well, input and advice will help. Absolutely. We want you to be a part of it, so thank I you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, Madam Clerk. Tracy Ballou. Welcome, Ms. Ballou. Hi, I'm Tracy Ballou, and I live at 206 West Nash. I would like to make one quick statement about the Yacht Basin Drive. I was always hoping that it could just be a pedestrian and golf cart because all the parking uh, uh, spaces you can uh, access from Bay and Moore Street because I've seen people almost get hit on that road you know, when the tourists are here and everything. So it'd be really nice just to have it as a pedestrian way for just golf carts, bicycles, and people. Because something, one of these days, somebody's gonna get hurt with those cars going down that street. I know you're voting on it tonight. I didn't know about it before, but I just wanted to put my two cents in. So my other thing that I wanted to get started with and put some food for thought to y'all is about the rights of way. Um, 
I live in the historic district, and that seems where this is headed to be focused on is on the rights of way. I will just tell you that I know that the front of my house I do not own. But when I bought this old historic house and I revitalized it and made it a beautiful historic home, the front of it was dirt. You know, it's like fe feet and feet of dirt. So I didn't want dirt to take away from this beautiful home. So of course I landscaped it and made it pretty. And it also has access. I've also had pipes that have been worked on to my house and in the street from there. And I do understand that you do have to have access. But I did want to state that, you know, we all and everybody who has in the historic area has taken time and their money to make it pretty. And that's what makes our town so charming is instead of having dirt roads in front of everything taking away from it. So I wanted to know, these are the questions that I wanted to pose for food for thought while y'all are starting this conversation, is the trees. There are hundreds of beautiful live oak trees that are in your rights of way. Is the town's plan to clear cut these trees? All of our beautiful trees that make the charm of Southport? What is the city's plan after you fine and make everybody take out all the beautiful shrubs and everything, it'll just be dirt. What is your plan? Are you going to now pave this? You know, what, what, what is the ultimate plan? I know that infrastructure is going to have to be redone. We're going to have to do uh, sewer pipes and all of that, but what is the end plan here? You know, you're gonna clear cut all the trees and pave the parking lot, you know? Is this, is the goal of this, of this, to uh, make more parking because you can designate your rights of way. There are a lot of people in the historic area that have no driveways. Their only parking spaces are in front of their house, which is in the rights of way. So we need to think about that. We also, this will also affect property values in our historic area, historic area. And so that's something to consider. And so we need to think about the charm of our town and the beauty of it. And we do understand that these things have to be done, but could we do all of that and then we could put what we spent to make to back to make it pretty, but if you're gonna pave it and take down all of our trees, that's going to ruin the aspect of the town. So I just wanted to get that out there so y'all could have these questions that we as residents, and I represent a group of our residents in the historic area that we're gonna wanna know the answers to. So thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Ballou. Uh, Madam Clark. Andrew Boyd. Welcome, Mr. Boyd. My name is Andrew Boyd. I live at 828 North Caswell Avenue here in Southport. Uh, first thing I'd like to talk about <clears throat> is, a, is a safety issue that I found. Um, it's been there for quite some time. This goes back to after the uh, House Street project was done. Um, it was never finished all the way. I know everybody thinks that it is, but when that was repaved at the corner of um, Bay and House Street, there's a, where the sidewalk is, there's about a four inch drop off from the road to the sidewalk. And th this was, this happened well before we put in all these pretty sidewalk things that nobody uses anyways. You know, when I drive up and down House Street, I gotta stop because people are going out in the middle of the road. But anyways, that's a big safety concern um, <coughs> that, that needs to be addressed. That, you know, that, that project was never finished. There's also, there are also some um, sandbags out there, I guess from one of the storms or something. So that's my first uh, thing I'd like to talk about. The, this, another thing I'd like to talk about are, are some of the ordinances that we have here. <coughs> um, and, and these are some things that are um, near and dear to my heart. Okay, based on the um, March 7th report from the code enforcement officer, I would like to know what the zoning ordinances are that uh, state about A-frame sandwich signs. I've, I've done a lot of research on the, the city website in the ordinances to, to try to figure out because they directly affect my family. Um, there, there used to be something in there for businesses. It's no longer there that I found. There is something for, um, for higher tours, but, but nothing else. So, but this thing says here that, um, that there is a zoning ordinance about A-frame signs in particular. And if, if that is the case, um, I walked down 
House Street last night because I typically, I live down um, near locals and I, I come downtown quite a bit. So there are three different signs. There are these A-frame type of signs um, that were left out overnight. One, um, one of them was on the other side of the sidewalk towards the business, so there's probably no jurisdiction there. But there are two other ones that were in between the road and the sidewalk, and they are there almost every night. So, you know, <clears throat> if, the, if w whatever the rule is, I just want everybody to have to follow the same rule. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Um, another thing from uh, the code enforcement officer, and I apologize for being late on this. I, I didn't have time to come to any previous uh, meeting. This is from um, January 25th. Um, and, and this, this I just downloaded today from the website, the city of Southport website, the, the meeting package. Um, all, the, all the different departments have their reports that are listed in here. Okay, so I'm just gonna read this word for word here. <clears throat> uh, tour permit, was able to stop by and deliver a tour permit packet to the Adventure Kayak Company for their upcoming tour season. Was notified by the owner that the city no longer requires a permit for the kayak portion of the tours. We'll double check with Keith Henley because too many business owners feel it is okay not to tell me the truth or all the truth. All right. <clears throat> My wife is a business owner in this town and I don't take kindly to being called a liar, nor does she. Okay, so I don't know why no one is reading these things from your, you know, and then to also post it on the website is that uh, it really, I'm really disappointed in that. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. The next thing I'd like to talk about is um, big government, okay? I personally, I, I prefer less government involvement in everything, you know, everybody wants to have their own opinion and I understand that. Um, but what I'm concerned about mainly is, is spending, okay? When I look at, <clears throat> when I look, I've, I've gone through and I've printed out quite a bit of stuff here that I've been researching, okay? Every department in the city wants more staff. That means I'm gonna have to pay more money. I, I didn't get a pay raise this year. I have inflation, I have to pay much more at the grocery store, I have to pay much more when I go fill up my car, and now every year I'm gonna have to pay more and more to the city. And I, I personally, <clears throat> as a citizen here, I would like to see the city you know, just sharpen your pencils and look hard at what you're spending and make sure that, that they're the right thing. You know, I, I don't know if we you know, need to hire a whole bunch more people to do all these things. I know that we're trying to do, maybe we're trying to do too much, too many things all at once. Or maybe we should focus on a couple of key, key things, get those done, and then move forward. <coughs> um, and kind of to go along with that, you know, we, we in, the, in the city of Southport, there has been a lot of growth, a lot of new houses being built all over the place. All right, so I assume that all those people have to pay uh, water and water and sewer just as everybody else. So my question is with, with the increase that all those people are paying, why is my share still going up every year and not down or at least stagnant over some period of time? Um, so, well, I have some other stuff, but that's pretty much the main things I wanted to talk about. Um, maybe some other time I could discuss some of the uh, budget items and, and line items um, with some of the, the key people. But thank you for your time, appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, yes, and we have uh, budget workshops coming up, so that would something that you would probably want to attend or be a part of. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Jenna Fontaine. Welcome, Ms. Fontaine, and someone help her with the uh, microphone, if you would, pro tem. We want to make sure we hear everything, just like you did last time. Thank oh, you. thank you. That's so perfect. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you, board. I am Jenna Fontaine. I live in River Mist. Um, I, one of my big things that I just bug about is pedestrian safety. I really um, like 
the way the Yacht Basin is currently with it, the traffic going one way. I do have some suggestions. I think it would work better with improved signage um, and to drive it like you came from New York. And where am I going? You know, we know where to go. But where, where am I supposed to go? So be really proactive with signage. Um, number two, I think improved street markings like the pedestrian markings and crosswalks would be a big help. And the third thing, I think, this is just my little personal opinion from my little self, is um, instead of taking the traffic up onto Caswell and those little small streets towards the left, I don't understand why it just can't be routed around to more streets. And what that would do is when they hit the light, at <coughs> first of all, people would know how to get back to the ferry. I've heard that, where's Wall Street? Where's the ferry? I'm lost, you know? And um, there could be signage to the ferry. There could be signage to say, go right if you want to see more of the river or go at Howe Street, go left, and you will go out of Southport and down to 11. And I just think that would, it's a bigger street. People are used to using more street, and I think that would work pretty well. That's just my humble opinion, and I've never really studied traffic except as a person who is trying to drive safely and walk. Thank you, Ms. Fontaine. Uh, Madam Clerk. Jenny Prentice. Welcome, Ms. Prentice. I'm Jenny Prentice, 5906 Dutchman Creek Road in Southport, and I'm a member of No High Density Southport. Mr. Mayor, Board of Aldermen, and staff, I want to thank you for the opportunity to express public comments at, at these meetings. I think it's important and I think it, it means a lot to all of us, so thank you. Um, no High Density Southport appreciates your recent efforts to address the onslaught of North Carolina legislative bills being proposed that would strip or severely limit zoning authority by local municipalities. We also appreciate staff and elected officials, your increased involvement in your communication with the North Carolina League of Mus Municipalities and the surrounding municipality officials. We're thankful for the city's website, um, the public notices that you all put out to keep notices informed about these bills. In addition to the city's communication efforts, No High Density has also been working hard to provide updates, factual information, and urging our citizens to contact the representatives with concerns about these harmful bills via our Facebook page and other social media outlets. We were told by our district legislators that these calls and social media posts by No High Density played a huge role in having the Workforce Housing Bill parked in the Rules Committee by Senator Raven so it would not be sent out for a vote this season, this session. However, the bad news is, is that the bill was reintroduced under a slightly different name um, under the North Carolina House using the same sheep in wolf's clothing tactic similar to the bill parked by Senator Rabin. The bill would be a dream come true for the North Carolina associations of developers and realtors um, who were heavily involved in writing and lobbying for it. 
in reality, the bill has minimal benefits for workforce affordable housing and huge wins for developers and realtors. This freight train of other bills to limit our city's zoning authority have continued at a rapid pace in this legislative session. One of the most concerning one bills is um, Senate Bill 675 that proposes the elimination of extraterritorial jurisdiction in municipalities. Proponents need to be especially aware of the intentional deceit used in the titles and first few lines of these bills. The mention of schools in the very first part of the bill gains automatic votes from legislators who only scan and don't read entire bills. The first few words in the bill's description refers to schools being able to be built in commercial districts. But the second part of the description ends with the words and eliminate extraterritorial jurisdictions. Further down, part three of the bill, ETJs are proposed to be eliminated, and there weren't any mention of schools there. What does the elimination of ETJ mean for Southport in Brunswick County? It means Southport would no longer have jurisdiction over zoning for any of its ETJ areas, including approximately uh, 376 acres that will be resubmitted for development by Project Indigo. The same would hold true for municipalities in Brunswick County and across the state. So why are ETJs important? Here's a few facts from the North Carolina League of Municipalities. ETJ authority came about after post-World War II boom due to the chaotic and unregulated development along urban fringe with incompatibility that uses endangering, incompatibility uses that um, can endanger both health and property values of those living inside those boundaries. Today, with counties adopting their own land use policies, ETJ has become more important planning tool than ever before in this fast growing area with taxpayer funded resources for infrastructure that must be carefully appropriated to meet the needs of the residents. The maximum size of an ETJ is determined by a municipality's population. The extraterritorial area may extend up to one mile from the city limits for cities with populations like ours with pop that are less than 10,000. And protecting homes and businesses from incompatible uses continues to be an important, fe an important feature of the ETJs. So in conclusion, if the bulk development and land use bills pass North Carolina municipalities like Southport, um, they would be stripping um, the town's zoning authority. We've been told by a local developer that opposition from small towns like Southport really won't make a difference when up against the powerhouse districts in Raleigh and Charlotte. But you know what? We proved them wrong. No High Density Southport urges the city to keep these harmful bills regularly updated for residents placing them front and center on the city's website rather than several clicks inside the development department's page. And Mr. Mayor, I appreciate your working with uh, the other local mayors. Um, hopefully that group can grow to all of Eastern North Carolina and you all can continue to, dr to develop strategic plans because we're up against Raleigh and Charlotte. No High Density took proactive steps by sending out news releases to area media that resulted in WWAY TV coverage last week with the mayor and aldermen and a member of No High Density. We ask that the city communication staff 
take the same proactive steps by calling the media's attention to major concerns by small coastal sounds, uh, uh, towns like Southport that have unique environmental and geographical features that could have harmful impact without local zoning authority. There's so many good reasons to preserve municipal government authority and the legislators and lobbyists in the so-called powerhouse counties need to understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plenty. Madam Clerk. Ms. Pat Kirkman. I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to say how encouraged I am, Mr. Mayor, that after these months and months that you are anticipating a cemetery committee and I am anticipating over the next months and months and months to see how this will come to fruitility. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirkman, and we look forward to your input. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Maria Swenson. Welcome, Ms. Swenson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Swenson. I live at 107 North Atlantic Avenue. I hope everybody enjoyed this wonderful day. I'm going to ask the board if I can please give one of these to each of you before I start to speak. Is that okay? I didn't know the protocol for that. I hope I printed out enough. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, board and mayor and elected officials for allowing me to speak yet another time about the traffic pattern on Yacht Basin Drive. The aldermen, from what I'm led to believe, are to take their cues and learning from the Southport staff. Who do I mean by the Southport staff? Especially concerning safety. That would be Chief Coring and Chief Drew. Both of these gentlemen have been down to the op basin several times. And folks, I know you didn't see the picture, but we have decided that the two-way traffic pattern was safe. We drove two very large diesel trucks in opposite directions on Yacht Basin Drive, and there wasn't a situation. Chief Drew was gracious enough to bring down two fire trucks and run them as the old traffic pattern was, and it wasn't a hazard. I've been down there for a long time, as many of you know. The modifications that were made during COVID were temporary, and that was across the board, including the entire world. Most of those modifications are not in place anymore. Why is the Yacht Basin still acting like we're in a pandemic? Because we're not. The signage at Caswell and more on the corner, nice little cute blue sign, really sweet, you know, but it has what the attractions are. Do you know what that sign has said since we changed the pattern of traffic? Dining, straight ahead. That leads to one business in the Yacht Basin. 
because when you get to Yacht Basin Drive, you can no longer make a left. So what are we doing? The city is causing our businesses to suffer. We're losing revenue. I know you don't all believe that because you say, oh, the Yacht Basin's so busy, I don't go there because I'm a local and I only go in, when it's not in season. It still is affecting us. And not only is it affecting us financially, it's affecting the city. By detouring these people who are totally lost, if they're coming from New York, around an area they don't know and forcing them to drive through residential areas. Is that what we want to do? Force the commercial traffic into the residential areas? I hope not. Now, the high water situation. If you've lived here more than one year, you know that the Yacht Basin floods. And at this particular moment, with the way the traffic pattern is set up, it forces people to drive through high salt water. That is not safe. Nobody in this room can convince me that that's a safe traffic pattern. No one. And not only that, the damage that it causes to people's vehicles, it's salt water. That isn't safe. The city has promised signage, stop signs, road markings, and nothing has happened. Right now, if you drive down Bay Street and you see people pulling in to park in front of the empty parking lot, these trucks are hanging out in the street. Let's not even bring up the fact that they all have hitches on the back to tow things. That is dangerous. Signage was promised. Suggestions were made. Make it golf cart parking only. We were told we can do that. I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure what's going on here because we got all these bump outs now and there's nothing being done to the op basin. The people who invested there all those years ago have done everything they can to promote it. The city didn't have to make the Yacht Basin. The citizens and business owners made the Yacht Basin, which is why I'm a little confused why the board isn't listening to the business people down there. We pay taxes, we bring in revenue. We know the way it was worked. I have never in my entire time there seen anybody majorly injured. Have there been a couple fender benders? Sure, but I haven't seen anybody injured. One fourth of July, we had an incident. One fourth of July, we had an incident. All of the businesses were closed. It had nothing to do with us being open. It had to do with the tourists that were coming into town. Over the years, the traffic pattern at the Yacht Basin, I had to write this one down. The traffic pattern at the Yacht Basin has always encroached on the property in front of Flaves. We have not said anything negative. Why? Because we, like good neighbors, we want people to enjoy our town and the waterfront. I feel this traffic pattern is confusing the dickens out of them. By the way, for most of you who know me, the thing at the top of this page says do not cuss. Okay. <laughs> My husband has repaired Yacht Basin Drive and Bay Street holes numerous times at our expense. Why? Why not? We're citizens. We're neighbors. I'm asking our elected officials who were elected by us citizens, to hear us. We know the Yacht Basin, and over the years developed that area to be a place for everyone to enjoy. Please listen to your citizens and business owners, and most importantly, the business owners who love that area and want to see it continue to grow. I ask that you change the pattern tonight. 
And if it's a stalemate, I ask that a vote is made. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Well said. Thank you. Madam Clark. Craig Blanks. Welcome, Chef. Thank you. Uh, Craig Blanks, 5012 Robert Rourke Drive, and I manage six pieces of property in the Yacht Basin, Frying Pan Restaurant, American Fish, the two houses that everybody so loves, 102 South Castle, and now the Yoga Dock. Um, not much more I can say. I agree with what Maria is saying. I've spent the last 11 years in that yacht basin building that corner up to the best I can. Never had any help from the city, never had any help from anybody that we didn't bring in. Um, I'm down there 80, 100 hours a week. The traffic pattern does not work. It's hurting us. We need to change it back. We need better signage. We need more lighting. South Castle between Moore and Bay is dark. And I believe Chief Corrin can attest most of the vehicles that have been damaged in the yacht basin have been damaged on that street. I started asking Kerry McDuffie what, five years ago for more lighting. Then it's fallen on deaf ears. The intersection at Caswell and Moore needs to have a flashing red light. I watch multiple cars all day long run through that stop sign because they can't see it. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Mr. Paul Swenson. Welcome, Mr. Swenson. Paul Swenson, 107 North Atlantic Avenue, Southport. Good evening. Um, I didn't read the uh, State Board pilot. But I saw people came up to me today and said there was some consideration for the traffic pattern being reversed that was in the paper. And um, I'm totally against that. Whatever your vote is tonight, I think that's the wrong move. And I can give you a couple reasons. Number one, well, I'll speak up for the potters. If I was the potters and you could go, you got down Moore Street and you couldn't make a right hand turn to go to their business, I'd be kind of upset. The other reason I have is that there's eight other businesses on Yacht Basin Drive and Bay Street. They are, I'll name them so you all know, it's the Mullet, it's the Pilots, it's Edgewater 122, it's the Provision Company, it's the Twin Towers, it's American Fish, it is the Frying Pan, and it's the Yoga Dock. All these businesses would be affected if the, pre if the uh, traffic pattern gets reversed. Now, I'm going to give you my little spiel. I've done it a number of times here. I'm going to give you the little lesson because some board members have flunked it, so I'm going to give it again. It's called the case of the three tides. First tide, first case of the three high tides. Let me correct myself. Okay, number one, there's one high tide that guess what happens? No water gets in the street at all. There is no water. There's no salt water. There's nothing in the streets. Yacht Basin Drive, Bay Street, completely dry. Then there's another tide. And in that tide, the whole, all the streets are inundated with flood water. You're up to your ankles in water, all the way up Yacht Basin Drive, all the way up Bay Street. Then there's the third, tri the third tide, and this is the one that gets to my point about reversing the traffic pattern. And that is the in-between tide. And this is what happens. Now, pay everybody pay attention. So the water comes in, the lowest point is right by Fishy Fishy. That is the intersection of Moore Street and Yacht Basin Drive. The water comes up, and then it moves slowly up towards the mullet. Sometimes it'll go up to uh, the play parking lot, and guess what? It stops. It doesn't get any higher. And you have this little lake. Okay, now here's my point. If you reverse the traffic pattern, you come down Moore Street, you have this little lake that you have to go through. It's salt water, 
and you don't want to go through it. But if you were coming down Bay Street, there are 150 parking spaces that you could get to to those eight businesses without having to drive through salt water. So to just to ease the traffic on Bruns Brunswick Street, to do a disservice to eight other uh, businesses, commercial businesses in the Yacht Basin, I don't think is fair. And that's what I have to say. I'm going to come back another night, and I'm going to talk about Yacht Basin Drive and the water line that's underneath it. Because today it finally got repaired after a week. It's a broken water line, just leak, it's just a leak. But this is the fourth time within a year it's had to be repaired. And I'm afraid one day it's not just going to have a leak, it's going to break, and some of the businesses down there will be without water. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swinson. Madam Clark. Wantana Frank. Welcome, Ms. Frank. My name is Wantana Frank, and I live at 516 North Lord Street. Um, I'm asking the board tonight. I'm, I'm here um, talking about the alley abandonments. Um, I'm asking that the Board of Aldermen uh, do not approve the uh, alley abandonment request that is, is, is on record right now. I'm asking the City of Aldermen, I'm asking the Board of Aldermen to establish another committee, a alley committee. Um, committees help. We had a committee to uh, decide if we were gonna resurface the tennis courts. We had a committee to decide if we were gonna move the visitor center to Fort Johnson. We had a committee to uh, decide about our museum and I think good things come out of forming committees. The alley committee could have a chance to uh, converse and talk with the uh, residents that have alleys. Um, and also uh, the city can get a hold of the alleys that are dormant here now in Southport. Um, some alleys are used and they're beautiful. Um, I think some of the history uh, I hear so many things about why the why alleyways, the, 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 the ice man, all types of things. But uh, my mother-in-law, she's 89, 90 in August, and she tells me that they were used for various things, the ice and also for student, uh, for, for the children to walk behind their houses. You know, their parents felt safe that they knew they could go out the back door and, and, and walk together um, to school. But I'm just asking the Board of Aldermen tonight, please don't make a a decision tonight because it's gone back to the planning board, it's back here. So normally when that happens, we don't have a lot of information and we just need to uh, do some more research. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, interesting topic, thank you. Madam Clerk. Adam Stedman. Welcome Mr. Stedman. Hello again, everyone. I'm Adam Stedman. Um, I live on uh, Dutchman Creek Road in Indigo Plantation. Um, I'm following up regarding uh, the upcoming budget. Um, I had mentioned a few months ago regarding the um, importance of uh, you know, adjusting the ad valorem tax rate to ensure revenue neutrality in light of the new valuation. Um, and I'll, I'll run through why this is important. Um, four years ago, we had a revaluation in 2019, and it turned out that both the city and the county decided not to adjust downward the tax rate in light of the revaluation. So basically what that meant is everyone in town, on average, has been paying 17 to 18% more in taxes as a result of the failure to readjust the tax rate in light of that revaluation. Basically, it was essentially a money grab by the city and the county. I mean, that was a relatively minor money grab, I guess at 17, 18%. This time, it's a lot more significant because of all of the um, property value increases with you know the pandemic and the migrations, et cetera. 
the, uh, I was told by uh, the tax office yesterday, I, I asked, and you know, this is not an official number because appeals are still pending, but the average uh, increase here in Southport based on this valuation will be 44%, you know, compared to 17, 18% four years ago. Now keep in mind that also includes new construction, which can kind of distort the numbers, but also four years ago, there was new construction as well, and it was still much lower. It's twice as much, over twice as much. So I know with the upcoming budget discussions, I think it's extremely important to, you know, keep the taxpayers in mind this year, especially given that we had, a, you know, on average 17, 18%, you know, tax increase, even, you know, four years ago, that was more of a de facto increase because the rate stayed the same, but the revaluations you know, basically meant that everyone was paying 17, 18% higher on that same ad valorem rate. And of course, last year, as everyone knows, and they should know based on tax, you know, tax statements they received last year, we had a 35, you know, approximately a 35% increase, uh, you know, based on the inflationary pressures and, you know, all of the, you know, the, the staff and police related changes from last year. So, I really do urge you to keep the taxpayer in mind this year. I mean, everyone's a tax, y'all are taxpayers. Everyone's a taxpayer. I really would, and I know Brunswick County has already mentioned they're likely going to, you know, adjust the ad valorem rate downward to reflect that revenue neutrality. I really urge the city to follow suit or closely follow suit, you know, adjustment, you know, one way or the other. And uh, I'm sure all the taxpayers would really appreciate it. Um, and also, I also want to mention, it's not just the tax rate that's gone up recently. Our, you know, water sewer rates have skyrocketed. So it's not like it's just, you know, it's not just the tax rate. I mean, everything's gone up. And I know, you know, the reality of inflation, I, I mean, you know, everyone's going to pay a bit more here and there. But I, I would say that our, you know, our taxpayers have already shouldered more than our fair share of burden. You know, fair share is usually used on the other side to advocate for higher taxes. I'm going to use it to advocate for you know, you know, the same or lower taxes, you know, I think we've already sheltered our fair share of burden in terms of local taxation. You know, the sewer rates have gone from about, you know, the base rates gone from about, I would say $75, $80 a month to about $120, $125 a month in the last couple of years because of all the, you know, and, and those, you know, those increases are understandable given, you know, the upgrades to the system. But the point is, you know, as for the discretionary spending in our budget, we need to, you know, kind of tie things down this year and really, you know, really focus on the items that are, you know, necessary as opposed to, you know, heavily discretionary would be nice. And, you know, I know a lot of the recreational items, I would, I would argue that we, would, we should probably, um, you know, work with the county on some of the more recreational items because they have a larger tax base. You know, I know I mentioned the pool, I, that might be more of a county thing anyway. But I mean, I think any, any spending toward a pool should be at the county level, not the city level, because we would still benefit from it at the county level. But the, the county has a lot larger tax base and it would be more generally beneficial at the county level. That's just an example. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you. Madam Clark. I actually just have one more uh, comment to read. It's from Mr. Fred Biss, who was not able to attend. He Thank lives you. at 216 North Atlantic Avenue, and he's been a resident of 18, for 18 years. Board of Aldermen, I am requesting that you lean your decision on the traffic pattern at the Yacht Basin in favor of pedestrians. Southport is making positive strides towards making this town a safer place for pedestrians. Marked crosswalks on House Street and other places are wonderful. The Yacht Basin area is primarily a pedestrian zone. Let's keep it that way. Pedestrian lanes do not need to, do need to be clearly marked. During the spring tide, tides and high tides, barricades should be in place to prevent uninformed, excuse me, drivers out of the salt water anyway. Whether the one lane traffic flow is clockwise or counterclockwise doesn't matter. Let's let the experts decide direction based on traffic needs. Better signage is key for drivers and pedestrians. I have noticed the one way traffic flow being kinder to the pedestrian. Let's keep it at a friendly pace, place for our locals and tourists on foot. I look forward to more and more marked crosswalks for the sake of pedestrians. Thank you for your consideration, Fred Biss. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that would like to speak that did not sign up? Okay. 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, I'm going to read the ethics statement. If any members know of any conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest concerning matters on the agenda, please so state at this time. Any conflict on the board? No one owns land in the Yacht Basin, right? Okay, good. All right, thank you. Thank you for your smiles. All right. Um, item E, uh, approval of the agenda. I will uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda with the exception of the removal of uh, Item five, item five, which is uh, the preliminary plat for uh, Oakton subdivision. Three. Oh, yeah, I have the one that was printed off oh, of. Okay. Yes, I have the one that was printed offline. I don't have any. Anyway, well, item three, excuse me. If you have the one, the agenda that was printed, I guess, today on mine, you know, it was Oakton. <laughs> Oakton, removing Oakton. Okay. Item Oakton, the preliminary plat, Oakton subdivision. So we're keeping the agenda as is, except for that. Thank you, uh, Alderman Carroll. Is there a second? Second, second by Alderman. Uh, Low Davis. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, item F, special recognition. We have the uh, police commendation officer of the year, uh, Chief Coring. On mine is item G. Is it, is my Good evening, Mayor and Board and citizens. I just want to take this opportunity anytime I can get out in front of you guys. I said last meeting to uh, present positive things about our police department. I want to take advantage of that. Uh, last month, Officer Kelly Garrido, who is here with us tonight, was recognized by our peers as Southport's Police Officer of the Year. Uh, we just wanted to present her to the town. A lot of times, you don't get to see all of our officers. Some of them work days and nights. So I, really want to try to get them out in front of you guys as much as I can. So we're very proud of Kelly. Prior to working with Southport, she worked with Wilmington PD. She's a veteran of the Air Force. She lives here in town, and she's just been a great asset. Uh, her peers said she's a go-getter, handles business with a smile. Uh, she's actually in FTO school all week, so she can get her certification to train other officers. So we just wanted to present her tonight. We're very proud of you. So Major Burt will present her, so we thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Again, thank you very much. And if there's anything we can do, just give us a call. 911. That'll get us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, our uh, second special recognition is a proclamation for Arbor Day. Forestry Committee, any members here would like to come up, stand with me, and then I'll present this uh, to you after I read the uh, proclamation. City of Southport Board of Aldermen Arbor Day Proclamation. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for planting trees. And whereas this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, mod moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce life-giving oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, beautify our community. 
and whereas trees in our city are a great source of joy and spiritual renewal, and whereas the city of Southport has a very active forestry committee, and most recently the committee planted live oak trees in the newly dedicated Taylor Field. We thank Scott Lynn and the forestry committee for this and other endeavors. Now, therefore, I, Joseph P. Hayden, Mayor of the City of Southport, and the Board of Aldermen do hereby proclaim April 28, 2023 as Arbor Day in the city and urge all citizens to celebrate and support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. And further, I urge all citizens to plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations, dated 13th day of April, 2023. Very quickly, um, I, it's very nice that we get the proclamation. I would like to invite everybody to come out on the 28th at noon down at the New Taylor Field for our Arbor Day celebration. Uh, our guest speaker is going to be Dr. Roger Hsu from the University of North Carolina Wilmington, who's going to speak on longleafs. And I'm quite proud because for the first time in as long as I've been involved in the committee, I'll be able to say, look over my shoulder and see all the trees that we've planted as opposed to we put two over there and there's three on Lord Street and one down on Owens or whatever. So please attend. If tourism comes through, there will be free ice cream, which I know is the major draw. So um, thank you very much. I look forward to being with there, and I'm sure many of our citizens will be there as well. So thank you. All right, item G, approval of the uh, consent agenda. And on there, the majority of our consent agenda is are the uh, minutes from our, uh, our board meetings and, and uh, our regular meetings and special joint meetings we had in March. Um, there's uh, two budget uh, amendments and a resolution concerning um, our House Street sewer project. I know you all remember that from two years ago. We, we had to uh, adjust the budget to make sure it evens out, and it, and it does, so we'll approve that. And there's also uh, Taylor Field project budget. We needed to move some money from Parks and Rec to the uh, Taylor Field Park and Grant Fund. So I will, um, and then there's a uh, budget reconciliation transfer that we have to do uh, to even things out every year. So I'll entertain a motion to uh, a approve the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Lombardi, a second by Mayor Pro Tem Mosteller. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, motion carried unanimously. Thank you, board. Um, we go to the agenda, uh, item H1, and that's the Ballhead Island Transportation Authority update, and I'm happy to welcome former Alderman Mr. Jim Powell who's our authority representative. So thank you, Mr. Powell, for coming in tonight. Get his uh, microphone. Mr. Mayor and Board Alderman, I'm Jim Powell, and I'm your representative for the Ballhead Island Transportation Authority. I will uh, tell you a little bit about the authority. The authority is a state law it was formed and passed in July of 17. And what it does, it is guaranteeing that there will always be transportation, barge service, and parking and all for Ballhead Island. That's the only way it could be guaranteed is through the state. Because if it was done individually, they could always declare bankruptcy regardless, <coughs> regardless of the utility commission uh, or not. <clears throat> so, it's 11, it's 11 board members, City of Southport, I represent the City of Southport, then, uh, and then Brunswick County, and then it's three from Ballhead, it's the um, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and one appointee, and then there's six from the legislature, and of the six from the legislature, one of them is a governor's appointment, and one of them or two of them is a DOT, and then we have the uh, Senate and the, uh, the House. 
and uh, where we stand. Uh, <clears throat> the authority did its diligence, and um, we offered uh, we offered uh, Ballhead forty seven and a half million dollars for it. And then when it went to have the blessings of the local government commission, the politics got into it. And so every time that we were supposed to go before the board, it was put to the side. So Ballhead had a chance to sell the property to uh, a real estate outfit from Raleigh for $68 million. So they took advantage of it and they, and they uh, 68 million. Now what's happening right now is that uh, <coughs> this stuff in Raleigh is holding up the closing of the deal for the uh, for Ballhead. And so that's about uh, all that I can tell you about it. Is there any questions? From Let me channel the question because I had the same question. When you say the, the things that are going on in Raleigh, could you explain that a little more so well, that I understand? It, really, does, it's does political. Does it appear that the legislation does it's not political. want to go through? It's political. And uh, uh, every time we get ready to go on the board, they, uh, it's, it's, uh, they do not put us on the board like they promised. And it's all political. Just clarify which board so the public knows. The LGC, gotcha. Local Thank Government you. Commission. Mm -hmm. So that there, at this point in time, there's no kind of date or estimated date that this will be resolved one way or the other? Right now, it's not um, an estimated date. Um, it is uh, going to court. So that it most likely would be resolved in the court system as opposed to the political arena. Probably so. Okay. Thank you. Who, who, who is involved with the court? Is it, you, is it the transportation, the ferry authority is planning on suing or has sued to prevent the sale to the no. company in Raleigh? Is that correct? No, it's all done by Ballhead Island Limited. It's, it's affecting them because they can't <clears throat> they can't uh, close out the deal on their property. And uh, in the long run, what that is doing is by not being able to close it out, they're not being able to close out Mr. George Mitchell's uh, estate. And so uh, this has been going on now for uh, let's see, almost nine years. And so BHI is gonna is who are, they're suing somebody? Who are they suing? I'm confused. I, so but BHI is selling the operation, right? Yes, they are. But here's the the deal. What's happening is that the village is <clears throat> one of the culprits. And what happened was a village had the first right of refusal the first time. They turned it down. And they were asked again later, and they turned it down again. Now they're trying to reverse it and saying they didn't do that, but that's just, uh, that's neither so, here nor there. So the village of Ballhead Island yes, is that's right. preventing that's the right. sale from moving that's forward right. at this that's point, right. and you anticipate a right. court right. case to resolve it. And uh, I, you know, I guess this has been mentioned before, but I'll just point out the city of Southport has no financial interest in any of this, has no ability to gain anything and no ability to lose anything. Well, to be honest with you, you know, we get taxes off that property down there now. And I'll give or take $30,000. And uh, when, the if, when the deal is completed, then what that will be will be they will continue it will not be taxes but they will continue to get the thirty thousand 
plus whatever it, it goes up. If the tax rate goes up, it'll go up, and we'll continue to get paid. You know, so I'll put a profit down there. To, to, conf to clarify, Mr. Powell, your statement, if the authority takes it over, that statement is how it's supposed to go, correct? Well, here's the deal. <clears throat> the authority was made is a law. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's a law. So the law can only be changed by going back through the legislature again. But his, the reason it was created was because that uh, the authority will be able to run uh, run the all the traffic, and they will not have to worry about the utility commission because the authority will do the same thing as the utility commission. The utility commission will go away. So what they're doing is the people who have obligated to buy it for $68 million, they have contacted the authority and asked us if we would consider running it, that portion of it for them. And so um, that's what we're sitting here waiting on. That's the reason the authority is still sitting around waiting on it. So somebody's going to pay $68 million mm -hmm. and turn the running of it over to the state. Well, it's not the... Well, well the, the authority. It's the, to, the authority. They came and asked us about it to start off with. Yes, if we would consider running it for them. And the authority obviously would get some money for that. Yes, we would. And is there a profit margin when the, in that? Does, where does that money go to? <clears throat> well, I mean, to be honest with you, you'll, uh, you'll have to pay for, you know, the operations of everything. And then you'll also figure it's just like a business. you got to have replacements and all that kind of stuff over the lifetime of the, of the equipment. When you say you all, are you talking about us all? I'm talking about the authority. Okay. No, you don't have anything to do with it. The only thing you will do will continue to get the $30,000 that you're getting, plus as it rises, tax value and everything else, you know, just a hypothetical situation. Say it jumps to 50, you'll get 50. You know what? Yeah. Thank you. All right. And as you know, this board appoints the uh, Southport um, member on the authority. That's really our, our function in this, and we get the, the tax money from the property um, that is considered in Southport. So we don't have to run a ferry or anything like that. Now, we're talking about 72 acres down there. That's what we're talking about, really. Yeah, that's what we got, 72 acres. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for um, Mr. Powell? All right. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Powell. Thank you Appreciate very much. It. Thank you very much, Mayor and the board, for letting me come uh, before you and explain it. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you thank for you serving much. on that uh, okay. committee. Mm -hmm. And um, we move forward, so thank you. Uh, item uh, two on our agenda is the Police Department and City Hall Space Feasibility Study, Architect Selection, City Manager Theron. Yes, um, as um, the board knows you had given us uh, 50000 towards a uh, study of moving the police department out of City Hall and finding a location for them as, as well as building a police station uh, that would be in a much more prominent area than it's located in right now. And then with that occurring, City Hall, who is on top of each other, um, would be able to move into other areas of City Hall and be able to spread out and even maybe have a conference room, which would be wonderful because we don't even have a conference room in City Hall. Um, so when, after you gave us the money, uh, we did do a request for proposal. We received eight proposals 
we decided to interview four, and on that interview panel was Chief Corey, Major Burke, myself, uh, uh, our part-time engineer, uh, Tom Zilliak, and then also Tom Stanley observed. And uh, it was unanimous that all of us uh, very much wanted to recommend to you uh, Mosley Architects, um, they've had a lot of experience in this area, and um, we think it would be a great fit. But I think the thing that won us over, um, no matter what architect or consulting business or whatever that we recommend, we also know that we have to work as a team. So you have to have a really good rapport with whoever you're working with. And we all felt very, very comfortable with Mosley Architects being able to work with our staff and the police department to come up with the best plan. And uh, Josh Bennett is here with us tonight in case you have any questions for him. And uh, we would like to recommend that to you and move forward and let's get this thing going. Thank you, any questions for the city manager or, or for the uh, architect? Okay, well, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion, sir. Okay. So a motion to uh, move forward with the um, feasibility study, okay? And choosing an architect, okay? Um, motion by Alderman Alt and a second by, I think I heard Alderman Carroll and Mayor Pro Tem at the same time. So Alderman Carroll. So uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay, motion carried. Thank you, thank you board. Um, item three, uh, wastewater treatment plant debt. And I will call on uh, City Manager Theron. This is another uh, ongoing project so that, that's been talked about for quite a while and that is having an expansion be made to the Brunswick County uh, wastewater treatment plant in order to take our waste because right now they do not have the capacity and we are not an original member of that group. So right now we've been paying a surcharge uh, in order to get that, but they, they just are not gonna be able to do that without having an expansion put onto the plant. So um, originally uh, the board did get a, a loan and we were thought, estimated it to be about $30 million. The bids were opened right about the time that I came here and uh, the lowest bid was $47 million. So uh, that's a big, huge gap. And so what we were trying to do as staff was trying to find a way to say, how can we pay for this uh, gap? And the county was asking that the board make a decision on how much debt they were willing to take on to have that expansion uh, put onto the plant. Uh, and we have recently had a meeting with the local government commission, which oversees and approves whether municipalities can issue debt. Our financial advisors, First Tryon, had um, given a presentation to this board that the only way that we would be able to take on another 27 to $30 million was to do a revenue bond. And a revenue bond would be, what that means is that you would use the user fees to pay down the bond. And as was brought up by you, sir, I mean, the rates have been going extremely high. And the reason it has been going high over the last few years, um, about a 10% um, increase, is that um, we have to be able to start paying the, the debt down. So the bills have gone up in order to pay the original 30 and not this ex you know, additional 27 million that we think it's gonna be. So the financial advisors were saying, look, the only way you can do this is issue a revenue bond, which would then mean the rates would keep going up 10% over the next three to four years, every single year on top of each other. When we made that presentation to the local government commission, uh, not that they came out and said it, but I could tell you what was insinuated was we are not going to allow Southport to take that kind of debt. So I went back. And, well, let me back up. And they also said the best um, way forward that they felt we should do this is to finish our merger feasibility study, which we're working on right now, and make sure we support and let the county know that we want to do a merger with them and let them take over our entire system. So 
um, in front of you tonight, and I've already told the county manager this, instead of asking how much debt do you wanna take on, what I'm gonna ask you to do, and I think this will help with the local government commission, is to basically say, county, we are definitely supportive of doing a merger. We, we have to wait for this study to be done, which could take another nine months, but this is the direction we really, really wanna move in. Um, that's part A. Part B is we've received notification within the last three or four days that the state is giving us a revolving loan fund um, uh, grant, not a grant, it's a loan, of 8,544,320 to upgrade the system we have, which would help us in our quest to merge with the county. Uh, so what I'm asking you to do also tonight is to have the city staff go to the local government commission to have them approve us accepting that loan at a 1.9%, 95% interest rate because the local government commission wants us to fix our system so the county is more readily going to say, yes, we will take your system. And then we won't, you know, we can get ourselves out of the sewer water business, which would be wonderful. So, so basically what we want to do is upgrade our system and that way we will not, and then have the county take it over and then we will not be responsible for the million to build the expansion on that plant. They will go ahead and take it over. And that really is the best way forward in terms of the debt that we would, we could avoid having to be under that we really could not tolerate because our citizens shouldn't have 10% every year. I mean, that gets intolerable. So board, there's a resolution. I believe that they printed a, a copy for you. And um, it basically says that the city of Southport needs to have a greater capacity for our wastewater. The County of Brunswick is willing to expand its plant to accept Southport's capacity. City of Southport and its Board of Aldwin wish to continue with the city's merger feasibility study with the intent to ask the county to merge our system with theirs. Whereas to upgrade our system, to see that the merger is a successful one, the board requests that the city staff proceed with requesting from the local government commission the ability to accept the 8,544,320 state revolving loan fund at a 1.95% interest rate. Now therefore be it resolved by the Southport Board of Aldermen that Bonnie Theron, the city manager, is authorized and directed to prepare a letter of intent to the Brunswick County Board of Commissioners about the city's desire to enter a merger of our sewer and water system and will be able to make a presentation to the county on this issue once the merger feasibility study is completed. And the Board of Aldermen requests the staff move forward with the processes to accept the eight million 544,000 state revolving loan fund and a grant of 1.2 million to evaluate and rehab our wastewater system. So this is the resolution that we're asking the board to uh, adopt and I will uh, entertain a motion. So moved. Alderman Davis, is there a second? Second by Mr. Lombardi, any, any discussion, any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion, resolution carries. If I can just say one thing. Please. Um, one thing I forgot to mention too is the county is gonna get back to us because trust me, we're not just, we're not gonna get off uh, free, scot free on this either. So the question is, how is the county going to now, you know, have us, um, whether it's gonna be a surcharge or something. Um, they went out to rebid we're gonna see what those rebids are gonna look like probably, because they're gonna go out at the end of April, May, June. Probably in July we'll know. My fear is those bids are gonna be even higher. So the question is then, how do we work with the county to counteract that? So there's still an unknown, but I think with the local government commission, your vote is the right way to go. Thank you. Um, item four. Uh, additional engineering fees, wastewater treatment plant expansion. City Manager Thera. Yes, this is uh, actually um, relevant to the topic we just discussed. Um, this week I received an email 
from Brent Lockamy, who works for the Water and Sewer Division for the county. Because of the rebid, because they are going to um, extend the time to have that plant built, because the vendors have said we can never build it as fast as you want it built and still try to lower the cost, um, the engineers that the county have hired, but we have to pay for, uh, are asking for an additional $405,893 for the rebid and construction oversight of that entire project. The county will pay them first and then we reimburse. Um, and I know, uh, trust me, I went, what the heck is that gonna pay for? Uh, because that seems like a lot of money. But they did have to redo the entire bid package uh, and then they had to um, work on, uh, the construction oversight is gonna take even longer, so that means more hours for the engineer and that's extended out. But you know, it's, it's a lot of money, but that is what's gonna be needed to see this to fruition with the engineers. So I said I would bring it forward to you because Mr. Lockerbie has to present it at the May uh, commission meeting for the county. Uh, Any questions yeah. for the uh, city manager. manager? Could you say something about what the uh, funding source for that? What it oh, what it means and where it's coming yeah, from? Basically, it. it will uh, be paid from the monies that we already have uh, for the building. So the thirty million that we have in state revolving loan funds now, that's how it's going to end up. We're going to reimburse them for it. But you have to remember, we can't spend any of that money until construction starts, so the county's gonna have to pay it up front and it'll get paid for it later, reimburse them later. So we, we won't be reimbursing them for in the next couple of, next few months anyway, right? No, At least. I would say it's gonna be, could be years or so. I'm hoping they might forget. <laughs> Don't record that, Madam Clerk, please. <laughs> All right, board, I will uh, will entertain a motion to um, go with the engineering fees for the wastewater expansion project. Is there a motion to proceed? No, I guess I'll do it. I'll, I'll move the motion. Okay, Alderman Allen, is there a second? Second by Mr. Lombardi. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, item six, and this will be the um, final plat for Lookout Point. Um, Ms. Meehan, our city planner. Good evening, Mayor, members of the board. If I may, I am going to forward through some of these so we can get So this is a, um, Mrs. Gayla Armstrong is the applicant owner of this property. Thank you. She has filed for her final plat approval for the subdivision of one lot um, into two properties. Um, the zoning is R10. It is located adjacent to the Cape Fear River and you can access this subdivision uh, through the landing. The preliminary plat was approved at the January 13th, 2022 alderman meeting when infrastructure was allowed to be provided. So um, according to the preliminary plat, plat um, you have two total lots. Um, it is the R10, there is a private right of way, which is the cul-de-sac, which was necessary to allow the correct dimensions for the lot size frontage. Um, and that meets, and that will be maintained by the um, owners privately. And there is water and sewer in place. This is the preliminary plat that shows the cul-de-sac. Um, and then this here, this is the um, final plat that was submitted that shows that it is in accordance with the preliminary plat. 
So therefore, it conforms with the preliminary PAT and all standards of the um, Unified Development Ordinance. So we recommend approval of this final PAT. Any questions for Ms. Meehan? All right, the, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll entertain a motion that we um, approve this uh, final plat for a lookout point. It looks like it's just taken one lot, splitting it in two, and um, they have the proper access and they've met the uh, standards of the ordinance. So uh, motion by Mayor Pro Tem. Is there a second? Second by Alderman Allen. Uh, any further discussion on uh, lookout point? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Item seven, uh, final plat, Highland Park. Uh, City Manager Theron. Uh, <coughs> yes. Um, Mr. Mintz um, is uh, requesting the approval of a fin final plat application for fit phase three of the Oaks at Highland Park. It's the last phase of that particular community. It consists of 19 single family lots. If not approved, the applicant could reapply for a final plat or appeal to superior court. Um, the preliminary plat was approved in October of 2020 under the previous uh, unified development ordinance. Infrastructure improvements have been made. Uh, the request appears to conform to all the applicable standards and being a buy right project appears to be deserving of approval uh, with associated condition of approval regarding sidewalks and a performance guarantee for their installation. So we are uh, presenting to the board uh, an approval for this, but make sure that the plat, and you should vote on this, the plat shall not be signed for, re for recordation until a performance guarantee and bond or other monetary instrument is received and accepted by the city of Southport staff for all sidewalks within the project. Any questions for the city manager or the city planner? Okay. I will uh, entertain a motion um, for this uh, final plat of Highland Park with the uh, performance bond for the um, sidewalks. So moved. Okay. Uh, motion by Alderman Davis. Is there a second? Second, Baldwin Allen. Any further discussion on this? This final plat. Okay. I just have a, a question um, about the sewer because it will stay private or they'll stay responsible for the sewer. Is that in a deed or in the covenants? Uh, I don't know. Mo, do you, Maureen, do you know? Would, th would that, how would, th how would that be codified? Because it, say, it, it says that, you know, that it would stay private. So I, I was just curious how that would be codified. I could find out for you. I, I, I may be way off base on this, but my recollection is that this may, that, that has to do with the, the private pump station, I think. But maybe I'm, I may be misremembering. If you would please come up to the podium and make sure the microphone's on. My name is Jason Robbins. I represent the developer and builder in Highland Park. I work with Cobalt Banker Seacoast Advantage. I can speak to some extent to that question. The sewer that will serve the next 19 houses there will remain private and will be entrusted to currently to the developer and eventually to the homeowner association. So it would go into their documents. It will go into their formative documents, be recorded there. Um, that has not been done yet to my knowledge, but it is the developer is fully cognizant of that. And um, that will be the way going forward. Um, how often is, is it done that way, Pro Tem? Well, 
Jason Tate, this is an anomaly. This project started before and the standards changed or something and then they were allowed to continue to use the non-conforming standards. This isn't a, something that has happened before us and this is really, and that's why they're gonna have to keep it private. That's my understanding. That's correct. Does the motion have to be amended to make sure we, we throw that into it? I, I think. Um, you know, it'll take a minute. Condition. I don't know how. What What would we say, uh, Mo? They They have they recorded the HOA documents yet? They haven't even. Have they done that yet, Jason? They have done a preliminary HOA document, but essentially it's a placeholder just to stipulate right. that there will be a, a an association. It would have to be. So, uh, to your point, Alderman Alt, if we could amend, who's who made the motion? Low, uh, low. If we could just amend it. Um, that, um, and Brady, how would we mend it so that that was codified in? Oh, I know she can, no, I wanna know what the language would be. That's why I'm asking you uh, to, that it would be. To include the sewer portion of it. Um, so in, just to amend to include the sewer and the sidewalk. That the, the, uh, that the sewer was, well, what we would be doing would be saying that um, it would have to be recorded that way. You know what I'm saying? The oh, sewer, in, in so the that's, in, in the, the HOA the documents. HOA. You so can if say you could, it just like that. Okay, Lo, would you be willing to amend your motion to include, um, in addition to the um, uh, performance guarantee and bond for the sidewalk project, to also include um, uh, the condition that um, the sewer dedication to private uh, be included in the HOA documents? Yeah, as, as stated. amend as stated, and basically with uh, <coughs> the motion is as previously stated. Plus, we're including that the sewer would would remain private, and the reason it will be is that um, it doesn't meet the city standards or the county standards. And it be recorded with that. With that. All right, and it will be recorded um, as such with the HOA in the HOA document. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, Alderman Allen had the second. Okay, you're good with that, Alderman? Okay. Any further discussion on this interesting topic? I, I, no, I, seriously, just, I just want to say I mean, thank you to Karen for, not often. Thank, thank you, Karen, for catching that. Yeah. Because I missed that totally. Yeah, no, it's very good because it's not often that we see that. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried unanimously, thank you. Good discussion on that. Uh, item eight is the um, alley abandonment. Um, Ms. Meehan. This is the um, request for partial abandonment of the northern section of an alleyway. It's located at um, west of North Caswell Street and north of West 9th Street. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, uh, this was um, si sent to the um, planning board for discussion and a recommendation to the board in December. The um, planning board um, co had a committee that met three times to review this area. Um, so to take a look and again, just for the vicinity, um, it's right you can see this on the zoning map. Um, they're zoned R10 and that's where it is. Um, so the re review committee, um, there were several topics that were reviewed. Um, hold on one moment, sorry, I apologize. So this request is just for the northern part of the alley, so it's a portion um, that a dead ends into the, the properties above. Um, so just some more maps, but these were shown early, um, last year as, uh, as well. So the planning board committees discussed many items. Um, they considered a potential abandonment of the entire alleyway. There are abandoned um, city infrastructure within the alley, so they wanted to look at that and see if that was ever gonna be necessary for use again. They were looking at any future needs for the alley. Would the city ever need or any other um, access to that alleyway? Um, and also they were looking to see if this, um, 
this a request would um, consider become a precedent that would potentially um, become a precedent set for doing this alley. Um, so there were lots of discussion um, going back and forth, um, conversations within the committee, bringing back to the full planning board, and they could not come to a consensus one way or the other. Um, some were in favor of the abandonment, some were not, some just didn't know what to do. So therefore, the, um, the planning board brought it back to you for your discussion. So the question now is whether to agree for a resolution of intent to abandon. So this would just start the process of the abandonment itself, not have the consideration of the abandonment. So um, at that, I will leave you um, with your discussion. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Meehan? Um, I don't have any other questions. I, I think the question, my only question is, if, if we are not to take any action, do we need a motion to say that or do we just let it go away? That would be a law, a, a law question. <laughs> yeah, I think just for clarity, so make it's a not motion. just hang, hanging it. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. well I, I make a motion that we do not do this. If, if the motion is to not I, abandon. And, um, oh, yeah, the thank alley. you for clarifying it. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Could I make a yeah. friendly emotion, a, a friendly so, amendment to that? Sure. Or at least a suggestion. In that, uh, in my review of, the, of these alleyways, there's a lot more than just deliver an ice. There's a whole cultural thing in, in the city, and that I think we need to, between now and May figure out where we would like to go to, to have a discussion about the alleyways throughout the city. Can we clear them up? They belong to the city. Do we, do we clean them up in the, the walkways or bicycle paths, the, whatever they are, let's have a thought about what we're gonna do with them as opposed to just a place where vines grow. Uh, can, can I just make a suggestion though? I can tell you that the planning staff does not, May would not be a realistic Okay. I, I just want to set I, them up I, for success, and uh, just based on what I know they have to do. So, but I, 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 I fully I <laughs> defer to you on the date or <laughs> it, sometime in the in the summertime. Maybe we could just say we're heading in that direction. I think it's it's certainly part of that whole. Ultimately, once we get through the whole right away conversation, then that'll probably be the next. So um, I'd like to say this. I appreciate former alderman, lifelong resident of Southport, Ms. Wontana Frank, for enlightening us and giving us good guidance. I think that as we go forward looking at these alleyways, I hope that many longtime residents of Southport who remember the uses of all the many alleys will come forth and talk to us and give us some good guidance and advice. Okay, so um, excellent Since we're, discussion. Excuse so, me, just, yeah, just, just for a moment. I think um, my thought is as we continue the right-of-way conversation, we should stop referring to, they are alleyways, but they are certainly right-of-way. And so that should be a part of that conversation as we move forward. That's all right. And they're a huge part to Alderman Alt's conversation, a huge part of our cultural heritage. and. It's citizen land, and we don't know what the future might hold, so it's important. Do we really want to get into giving away city property, city land? So our, our motion would be that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor, to not adopt the resolution, to abandon the alleyways, and that uh, per Alderman Alt, sometime in the future, we will look into the right-of-way alleyway aspect of these uh, of these properties. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. And a thorough study. Okay, <laughs> Alderman Davis. Thank you. Um, and this the it was by Alderman Davis. The second was by. You did the first and Alderman second. Got it. So Mayor Pro Tem with the motion and uh, Alderman Davis with a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, motion carried unanimously. The resolution uh, does not pass. Thank you.
Uh, item nine, Kingsley Park bid acceptance and authorization. Uh, Madam Assistant City Manager, Dorothy Devon. Yes, thank you. Um, we have already been allocated funding through FEMA of $221,000 to cover the um, finger piers or finger docks that are gonna be installed at city, the city dock. So this is to select the contractor that would be doing the work. There were three bids um, submitted and um, Parks and Rec Director Heather Hempel suggested we go with, I think it's, I can't think of the name now, I apologize. It's, McPherson Marine, thank you. Um, they have already done a lot of work in the city and they do very good work. Yes, uh, Mr. McPherson does excellent work and as you know, he um, did the repair on our city dock. So um, any questions for uh, Ms. Dutton or the city manager on this? Okay, okay I'll entertain a motion, okay. Um, a motion to go forward with the uh, Kingsley Park bid acceptance with uh, McPherson, Mr. McPherson. Marine, yeah. yeah. McPherson Marine, yes. Um, is there a second? Ms. Alderman Lombardi. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item 10. Uh, build out study project, city manager Theron and Alderman uh, Rich Alt. So one of the outstanding questions that we have as we talk about all the different development in the city is exactly how many lots are left and what do they look like and what are they zoned and what's the potential build out both in the commercial and the residential areas uh, given the current zoning, it's the best we, that we know as we can do. It's called a comprehensive build out. The COG uh, Council of Government had uh, looked at this and gave us a proposal for that. Um, as I studied that and I was talking to the manager, uh, she's, I believe, is going to talk about a, a comprehensive build uh, plan, which is a much more extensive plan. It takes 18 to 24 months to do. So the question that was asked of, of, of our pl city planner was, will the plan that I'm asking us to pay for now dovetail and, and add to the comprehensive plan. I don't want to pay $14,500 if, if we're going this way and the comprehensive plan is going that way. And the answer we got was yes, it would help out in the, in the data collection for the master of the comprehensive plan. So what I'm asking for is a motion to, I'm proposing a motion to spend the $14,500, have COG do the plan and figure out exactly what we have left to build out because it goes towards our sewer capacity, it goes to our sewer build out, our water capacity, our water build out, it goes to electricity. If we're, we're, we're most likely gonna build another substation someplace, somewhere, and how much power does that substation have to, capacity should it have? So it fills a lot of gaps that we don't have right now. So that's my motion. Very well, yeah, did, that's sir. the motion. Is there a second? Second, second by Alderman Carroll. Any further discussion on this excellent topic? Yes, for me, uh, a, a question here. Would it not be wise to at least wait to see what happens with pending bills before the legislature? Because if, for example, Senate Bill 317, well, it's twin, coming through the house. If these pass, then this will completely change what the build out potential is through a, a very large part of our, our city. So I think we would be putting good money after bad if we do it right now. Let's wait a month or so and see what happens with the legislature. I think they're done at the end of June, aren't they? I mean, I, I, do, I see great value in doing this. I just think that I, 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 bills would need, uh, if these pass and even if they get vetoed and then over, overridden, um, this will change everything. Would you, what do you think if we, we pass it tonight and we ask the manager to implement it after the legislative process is over for, in Raleigh? I have to say, 
I don't know what's your hurry. My hurry is that we're going to be making other decisions in those in the, in the coming months, and, and it's going to take a number of months to build this out. I want COG to know that they're going to get it in, in June, most likely, and they can actually start prepping themselves about how it's going to happen. This is, I've been asking this for three years, and not one person has been able to tell me what we own as far as zoning rights, the zoning property in a town that is not a me megatropolis. So I would like to figure out what we own and how that is going to work. I don't understand what you mean by own. Well, we own the zoning rights and we own the responsibility to build out that correctly based on the zoning rights. So it, it goes to, all, as I said, the sewer, the water, the electricity, the substation. If we're gonna negotiate with somebody about substations, anybody, regardless of who it is, uh, or we're gonna have to foot the bill for a new substation. I don't know how we do that without knowing what our total build out's gonna look like. I think, yeah, I, I think we just need to go ahead and do this uh, because the same thing could appear next year. Uh, we're gonna fight like hell to make sure that this doesn't happen. And so go ahead, spend the money, get this done, We'd be facing the same thing next year this time, possibly. And, and staff, um, Alderman Davis, staff said that it would be a good tool to help them with the camp, uh, the update of the comprehensive plan. And I don't think even if you eliminate some of the numbers because of a bill or something that happens that. Uh, You've still got the other data. It's just d raw data. So I don't. I don't think. I, I doubt very seriously if they're gonna have. If we would have any savings if they didn't do part of the data. You know, the the time is the time pro most likely. Any other comments? Any other discussion? Any further questions? Um, all in favor of the uh, build-out study project? Uh, show of hands, please. Okay. All opposed? Okay, 5-1. Um, thank you, thank you. Good discussion. Um, item 11, credit card policy. Mr. Stevens, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Board. Um, I am the Deputy Finance Director for Finance here about the adoption of the credit card policy as well as the adoption of a new provider for said credit cards for department heads as well as the board's use. And this is to better keep track of any of the expenditures from the credit cards as well as keep each department responsible for their own expenses. So this basically is a credit card for each department and they're responsible for how it's spent and keep up with it and not go over a certain amount and don't leave home without it. That is correct. So it will be strictly on department heads and then it will also have a trail so that way each one can um, know what their finances are regarding that card and okay. we can easily keep track of it. All right. Any questions? Uh, for Mr. Stevens. I just, a, a suggestion for the sake of the public to know what kind of things do department heads buy with credit cards? This is not to question their right to do it and I know what they, what they do, but I, I doubt that the public does. Many times um, if there's training or travel, uh, the only way you can do that in advance is obviously you know, um, a credit card. Nowadays, there's many things that you can only buy uh, on Amazon or whatever sites. And again, they're credit cards, so they're going to have to be used. Um, I'm, as the department heads know, I'm always a little leery of these credit cards. So we took a long look at, uh, with the department heads. They, were, they knew what we were doing here, and they've agreed um, to try to limit it as much as we can to how much people are allowed to use those credit cards. 
um, and that the, the new credit card company, well, actually, it's our bank, that's who it is, where there's a way that we are going to be able to monitor it. They can monitor it. They can't now. That's part of the problem. And so this will help them do that and be able to look and say, hmm, do I have enough money or I don't? And uh, it'll really be very, very helpful for them. The other thing, too, is um, we end up getting a little bit money back on this credit card. So the more we spend, no, 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 I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, that's not the theory. <laughs> so, I mean, nowadays, you know, as we all know, you can, there's a lot you can't do. They're, businesses are not going to wait for a check to be processed, that's for sure. Thank you. I just hope that nobody has any suspicions about this and understands what a good move it is. Any further questions? Any further uh, discussion? Okay. I will uh, in entertain a motion to approve this uh, new credit card policy. Second. Um, Alderman Davis, is there a second? Second, second by Alderman Carroll. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Is there a particular company we went with that gave us a good rate? It's First, where are you, Brandon? First, back, first what bank? It would be First National Bank, Thank the you. same okay. as the City Central Depository. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good, good. So we keep it um, consistent. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item 12, and everyone left, and we're here finally at item 12. We probably should have had it earlier on, maybe. Uh, item 12, the yacht. <laughs> I, yes, we were hoping the uh, everyone else would be here too, but we're glad you are. Um, the yacht basin um, traffic pattern. Um, and as you know, it's, it's in your packet, and we have uh, seen this. We've heard presentations, and um, you, you know the options. Uh, it can go back to pre-pandemic direction where it was both ways. Uh, we have a, a pattern now where it is uh, one way uh, that goes from, um, you know, Bay Street, Yacht Basin Drive, and then up more or either out uh, Brunswick Street. So you have the option to continue it the way it is. You have an option to go back the way it was. But with either option, we plan, uh, and the city manager has been very clear about this, that we plan to have signage, lighting, um, better, uh, yeah, the um, markings of the pedestrian uh, travel and that type thing. Um, and, and so whatever you choose to do, there will be work done in the Yacht Basin for pedestrian safety. Either way, e either way you vote is pedestrian safety, public health safety in the Yacht Basin has to come first. And so um, I uh, will entertain a, a motion it, I, on, on this. I'd like, I'd like, I'd like first to see a presentation from either Bonnie and other city staff who made the recommendation. I don't know that We've heard the recommendation, but they haven't heard the recommendation. And so can we, is that okay? A absolutely. The public should hear why staff is recommending two ways. Uh, by all means. Well, we have both chiefs here, but I'll start off. Um, I asked them, my number one concern as a city manager is public safety. That's number one. So when this all came up, I asked them to please go out there, you're the experts, not me, along with our part-time engineer who has a vast experience with roads and uh, Mr. Stanley also, our uh, public uh, safety, no, what is it, not public works, I keep the public services department, sorry, I'm used to public works. Go down there and give me a recommendation. That's what I need from you. They came back and they said they, recommended to me uh, go back to the way it was. It worked fine for a number of years. It always has. 
Certainly, we need to do a lot more, as what the mayor mentioned, with markings and striping and everything like that. And we are prepared. Well, we were, we were prepared to start tomorrow until Mother Nature decided not to. Um, but no matter what your decision, we are prepared to move forward tomorrow and get these markings and pedestrian walkways and whatever we need um, started tomorrow. We've ordered all kinds of supplies for this and, and make sure that you know, it's done and done safely and done correctly. Um, I mean, if you want more specific reasons, you could ask the chiefs, I even hate to say that, um, but um, that was our recommendation to you. But again, it's your decision. You are the traffic authority by state statute. So it's your decision, no matter what you vote, whatever you decide, we're ready to move ahead. Well, oh, did you remain on record? Yeah, Chief I was Curry. hoping that the chiefs would maybe Chief weigh in on b both of them, weigh in on this. And Chief Corey, yes, please. Good afternoon. The main reason that I suggested that it go back to the way it was two ways is because of the tidal flooding. You have it on both ends. You have it at Moore Street and uh, Yacht Basin Drive. You have it at Bay and Caswell. If you have traffic going two ways, then if someone gets around the curve and there's flooding, they're able to turn around and go either direction to get out. As a fire department, we pr promote and tell people don't drive through standing water because it's dangerous. So that was the whole reason for my suggestion to go back to two-way traffic. We have put vehicles down there. We've checked. They're able to pass. Is it going to be tight? Sure it is, but it's been tight for decades down there, and they had two-way traffic. Uh, I've been in Southport all my life. I remember two major incidences that happened in the Yacht Basin. One was Miss Lillian McMillan who lived on Delaware Street. She drove off in the Yacht Basin in her car. That was probably 20 years ago. Uh, she had to be rescued by the fire department because she was still in the car underwater. Uh, the other major incident I remember, there was a motel across from Frying Pan uh, that Jack Lane owned and he had a monkey that got loose and terrorized people in the Yacht Basin. That's the only other major incident that I remember that happened in the Yacht Basin. We've not had any pedestrians that have been struck. We've not had any major accidents. Uh, the monkey got loose about 35 years ago, and I remember that. So those are the only, those are the only two uh, that I remember. Uh, so traffic can go both directions. Uh, Chief Corey might have some further to add. I'll start off by saying I was scared of that monkey. We rode by on the bus. He was in a cage mounted on the side of the hotel, and I was always scared of him, so I didn't like it when he got out. But echo and yeah, echo and the chief's comments again. The road was two ways until 2020 when we uh, decided to do what we did. I've heard both arguments. I've heard it from different citizens. I've heard it from the business owners. Put it back like it was when we decided to do the walk plan. It was a great idea, and it does work when it functions that way. But honestly, if you go down there now, people are walking in the road. Um, you know, so the high water is an issue. I've gotten hammered about that, saying, Chief, you're making us drive through water because we're going one direction, but everyone knows turn around, don't drown. That's the North Carolina policy. I mean, everybody knows to turn around, don't drive through water. We don't want you to do that. You can safely turn around at any point and drive back to safety. But um, so that's when we looked at it. We, again, the business owners were out. We, we, we went, you know, round and round. So two ways would work. It's worked in the past. We went down there. That's why we lined the vehicles up. We big trucks, cars, uh, the two large fire trucks to make sure they can pass through there. Um, so that, that's why we went back with just putting it back like it was until we can come up with a, at some point to take back the right of way. We've heard all these different arguments and different things. So that's kind of what we wanted to do. Is there any, any advantage to the businesses to have it two ways? Well, I mean, you heard their arguments. They're saying people can get in and out both directions right now and then. I've also heard complaints from the folks over on Brunswick Street where we're forcing traffic to go all the way around. And so, yeah, I think everybody can turn. And we do have people that come down Moore Street. It would be nice if everybody knew when they came, hey, I want to go to Fishy Fishy or I want to go to 
frying pan. They know exactly which road to navigate, but a lot of times they don't. A lot of people want to naturally go straight to Bay Street and take a right and look at the beautiful water. That's why we decided to go with that flow of traffic in that direction. Um, but the, the, you know, you've heard from the, the restaurant owner tonight. They're saying we're having issues with people parking in different ones, parking lots, and walking over to this one or that one. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, so, I, I, the the I know the yacht basin serves as an economic engine, and it's also the very heart of our community in many ways. Um, The way it was, even I, we continue to have more and more businesses down there. Back in the day, American Fish was a boat repair shop, you know, um, and uh, the mullet is reasonably new. So we, uh, even frying pan is, I don't know if it's maybe 10 years. I don't know how long frying pan's been there. So I appreciate um, that nothing's happened, but I can tell you, I, I was fortunate to, when I talked with Craig uh, at Frying Pan, he invited me to come back at a different time and stand up on his deck, and um, so I took a bunch of pictures <laughs> of it, and um, and it, it's, it's not unsafe this way, the one way, the way it's do being now. It's I, I'm asking because you wouldn't have let us do that if it was unsafe, right? Um, so um, I, I think we've in, invested a lot of time and energy in this. Um, we had a Yacht Basin Overlay Committee that had many recommendations. We then took, um, we had the COG do a mobility study and they came up with a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, it's already been mentioned tonight that we're doing a comprehensive plan for the town, um, and that certainly the Yacht Basin District would be uh, a part of that conversation uh, in the comprehensive plan, um, because what we need is a long-range master plan for that. Um, even our CAMA land use plan now, which is 2014, says pre prepare a specific waterfront development plan to address land use conflict issues in the Yacht Basin area. So it, it, I, I, I would ask that, um, I, I have a whole list of things that I think um, from those, both the mobility study and the um, uh, Yacht Basin Overlay Committee and the business owners, quite honestly, um, um, adding street lights there on Caswell. Um, I, I, for whatever reason, I had not seemed to have heard that before, but I've heard it now. And, and we can, we've got the funding for that and the electric, um, in our electric fund, we've got uh, enough surplus in that fund that we can have some, a couple of three street lights put there. Um, and so, and move the um, wayfinder sign, we can move it to the other corner at Yacht Basin, uh, I'm sorry, at Moore and Bay so that it'll be accurate. It's not really accurate because then it would send everybody around if we would move it to that other corner. Um, so there's a lot of low hanging fruit that we could do. Um, you know, directional signing, signage is, it seems to be the biggest concern because people don't know where to go because coming out of the frying pan parking lot, they need to know to go that way. Um, those were just some of my observations, but um, so anyway, uh, restripe the, the parking lots, all of the, even on um, Moore and Caswell, those parking spaces need to be adjusted so that they reflect the 18 foot in length that was recommended at the mobility study. So, and the same with, I know you talked about there on Bay Street, doing something there, however, with the parking that's hanging out now. So um, anyway, I would be in favor of keeping the direction the way it is. I have a question. Chief Corey, what is the speed limit? 
down there on Yacht Basin Drive? That's 25. Can that be lowered? Can you reduce it, say, to 10 miles an hour? I mean, you can, the board can do that. I can't, but you can. You guys are the authority on that. Okay. I mean, because as, as we all know, um, during really busy summer nights uh, at the height of the season, I, mean, I personally have stood in the middle of Yacht Basin Drive eating an ice cream cone, talking to dozens and dozens of other people. The, the drive is actually like a pedestrian walkway and then cars are trying to come along. If we could get that speed limit down to 10 miles an hour, then the cars are really going to have to creep along and that would help, I think, with safety either direction. I, I, I'm in concurrence with Ke Alderman uh, Mosteller on this as well. I've stood on the other side of this picture to looking at it the other way. Um, and I sat there and watched the cars. For, for the four years that I've looked at all of the studies and committees and everything else, I've never been shown a plot map that actually shows me where the street is, who owns what. I've seen them in people's arms and they've walked around with them, but I've never been able to be, see that. So I'm looking at the white truck here with the black holes that have been filled in with cold patch, which I'm a I was led to believe tonight was part of the street because citizens filled them in. Um, that is that part of the street? This, to me, that is the, if you're looking from the other side, that is the critical point for me, that, that turn from Bay Street to Yacht Basin Drive. And that if we owned from that co orange cone that's sitting in this picture towards the street, if we owned that and we paved that, we could make you know, a, a decent turn there. But these people are to totally sober, right? I'm assuming they were totally sober when this picture was taken. And they do sell a considerable amount of alcohol in that area. Now I have to admit that our, our bartenders and our bars in this town do a spectacular job of not over-serving. I mean, I've been down those bars hundreds of times and I've never seen drunks like I can see in other states. So they do a terrific job of this. Trust me, where I come from. Um, so, but, they're, but, but you put two drinks in somebody and that they're not, they're not an 08 and they're still, that, that's an issue. So until we can figure out, can we, we, we don't have the money for imminent domain. For imminent domain. We just don't have the money to spend for that. So perhaps we can negotiate sometime in the future, somebody gives us the property so that we can actually pave it and then we can have a more safer corner there. I'm willing to consider that in the future, but for right now, this is the poor signage. This is poor striping. This is poor asphalt. We need to get Alderman's uh, Lowe's sweet street sweeper down there once a week. We need, <laughs> we, we need to do a better job of cleaning up our heartthrob, I'm not a heartthrob, our, but the heart of our city here on the weekends and do a better job of me making this better. But for this year, we're almost, we're in this year already, I keep it the way it is and, and then reconsider later. What I would encourage our board to do tonight is to um, just let this go. Uh, city staff already has uh, obligation to maintain what already exists, striping, signage, whatever. Uh, I don't want us to, uh, <coughs> as a board, vote against the recommendation of city staff. I'd prefer to just let this go um, and, and, and not have to do that. I'm not following you because city staff is recommending we re return to two way but the and votes aren't yet, there to, the votes aren't there to do it so i'm sorry the votes are not there to do it well we don't know that yet okay we um I, i'm trying to figure out what you're recommending you say you want to let it go as what no motion made no motion made city staff wakes up tomorrow stripes signs whatever they're going to do but 
for us to you know hold this vote tonight i'm not but this is going to cost us money when we do whatever we're going to do and it's that just the striping alone is astronomical we have to give guidance to the yeah. city staff it's either going to be the one way as it is now with much better signage so people know enough to go down uh, Caswell, I think Caswell, instead of coming straight down Mord and running into Fishy Fish. What, we can manage this with proper signage, but to ask, I have no idea what the cost is, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if it's 100,000 um, bucks just to do all of this stuff. And they need guidance. I'm okay to make a motion. Well, the city manager would like to, to say something. Just, just one quick thing I need to say. I've been doing this a long time. I have never seen an elected body that, how do I put this? Um, you shouldn't worry about going against staff's recommendation. That's, we, we get it. You know, that's our role is to give you advice. If, you know, if you go the other way, we're good. Um, but we have got to have, I agree, some direction. We're going to be using a lot of money. In fact, some has already been spent because I made sure that they could um, be ready to do this immediately. But please don't ever worry about us getting upset if you vote against staff. I thank that, you for that, that because yeah. I've never seen it in 30 years. No. But um, certainly not, no, my don't point worry is, about it. No, I, I, and I appreciate, appreciate your comment. My, my concern is not hurting your feelings. I've hurt a lot of feelings, I'm sure. Uh, however, I don't know enough. You know, I can go down there and I can look and I can say, yeah, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense. So I have to rely on people that have more knowledge about a subject matter than I do. I'm, I've seen exactly what you've seen, ma'am. And, and I've seen exactly what the chiefs have seen. I've seen it work in both circumstances. So, no, I agree completely. We're, we're getting off track here. So you, you, have, you have the options and your job as an elected official is to make a decision. You're given the information and based on your experience and knowledge and understanding and hopefully wisdom, you make a decision. Sometimes it, it is agreeable with staff. What if staff said they wanted a 25% raise across the board? Would we, sounds good, doesn't it? But gotcha. we probably, probably w wouldn't go with it. Or, or, you know, what if they said, well, how about decrease our, our taxes by, you know, a nickel this year? That's probably not a, a, a good idea either. And the reason we raised taxes last year is because they had not been raised in five years and we, we needed that revenue. So it's a, um, you need to, as an elected official, sometimes decisions are hard, they're difficult, but we, we live here, we've been down there, we know the options, we know previously it was uh, both ways, both directions, but times have changed. The mullet wasn't there, American Fish is there, there are more people down there, there are more cars, there are more um, golf carts, more people, Bicycles. and so, yeah, bicycle. So, the question is, what is the best in terms of for our citizens for the safety of the Yacht Basin, in your opinion? It, this is an opinion, and it's based on your experience, knowledge, understanding of what goes on down there and um, what you believe is the right thing to do uh, as, you, as, for any, as for any decision, as for any vote. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we continue the tra existing traffic pattern and that um, staff, uh, all of these conversations that we've had tonight as far as lighting and moving the wayfinding signs so it's um, appropriate. And um, I would like to just throw out, um, uh, consider some kind of uh, signage uh, I know y'all are immediately gonna do something for the season, but if we could figure out, uh, staff could come up with some kind of signage that w had more design quality to it so it didn't look so industrial um, for the future. <laughs> Let me just say to that though, you gotta be careful of that because if you have decorative signage that are s um, traffic signs, then we can't enforce it. 
There are rules and regulations for traffic signs, what a stop sign has to look like. I can't make it look historic. No, it's I, not I, I got you. I just so I just want to make sure that people realize we might be able to do some decorative, but if you want to enforce that, they better, they're going to look ugly. <laughs> but well, I was just throwing that out there. Okay, <laughs> so that's my motion. Okay, we, we have a motion and what the city manager has said, and I agree, whichever direction you want this to go, we're fine with it. We just need to get moving on the signage so it, it's safe. Whichever, whichever way this board wants to decide, we're good with that, but we just have to get to work because the season is here, it's coming, and, and we want to make the necessary changes. Is that, uh, without putting words in your mouth, city manager, is that the best way? Thank you. No, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A second by Mr. Lombardi. And the motion, just so I'm clear and everyone is clear, is to keep the yacht basin traffic direction in, in the same direction that it is in right now. Is that correct? Okay. Um, any further discussion? And, and good discussion by the board on this. The only thing I would want to just say is the Yacht Basin Air District is so important to us, so it is um, appropriate that we've been as thorough as we have about this discussion. I mean, it truly is one of the crown jewels of our, of our town, and um, spending the time on this that we have certainly is beneficial for our citizens, and, um, and it's... Um, you can always revise. We can always uh, continue that process, but we need to get going on whatever we're doing starting tomorrow, and I appreciate that, city manager. Any further discussion? All in favor, show of hands, please. Any opposed? Vote is four to two. Uh, motion carried, thank you. Item 13, planning board appointments, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Mosteller and Alderman Allen. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this one if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, we have uh, three vacancies on the planning board. Um, a committee consisting of uh, planning board chair Sue Hodgen and myself and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Mosteller, who are the liaisons, the board of aldermen representatives to the planning board. Uh, we're the uh, nominating committee, interview committee, and we interviewed, uh, was it seven, eight candidates? They were all excellent. Um, it, it really is amazing the wealth of talent, talent that exists in this city. Uh, we're, we're extremely fortunate to have the people um, living here that we do. Um, the three seats, one was uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction um, regular seat. I know it's, it's just, all gets complicated. I don't want to drag this out, but you have regular and alternate member, full members and then alternate members. Um, so we have a ETJ full member. We had a um, uh, in-city full member and an in-city alternate member that those three slots needed to be filled. The recommendation of um, the committee is that we uh, reappoint uh, Chris Jones as the ETJ full member. And since he's in the ETJ, that will also have to go and be approved by the county commissioners. Um, Chris has um, been on the planning board now for several years and is uh, very active, uh, involved, um, very smart guy um, who brings a lot um, to the planning board and to our discussions. Um, then we have um, two, uh, for the city full uh, position, uh, we recommend a gentleman named Roy Pinder, who is a retired land planner and landscape architect. Um, he's been in Southport for a long time, 14, 15 years at least. Uh, he's been in, involved in um, a lot of um, development of and planning of projects that have occurred in Southport. He's very familiar with the development process. He's very uh, familiar with our UDO as well as other UDOs, of course, uh, and has a great 
obviously a great professional grasp of the planning process and a, a lot of really good knowledge and I'm delighted that he's um, decided that he decided to step up and apply to be on the planning board because I thought for a long time he would be a, a really good addition. Um, then the third seat, which is a city alternate position, we're, um, we've recommended a gentleman named Kevin Lachlan. He's a retired attorney who lived in Manassas, Virginia. Um, has a lot of community involvement up there, um, particularly with the Manassas uh, historic uh, district there in Manat the downtown historic district uh, in Manassas which we thought he actually was involved in the in the very beginning of that um, organization and worked very hard on it for a number of years and we thought that experience would be uh, um, particularly uh, relevant to what we're doing now starting up our um, historic commission locally so those are the three recommendations of the uh, nominating committee for the board. And Karen and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Alderman Allen? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Sorry. Uh, move to um, approve Chris Jones, I, I, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it because his is not, his a is an appointment. His a is a recommendation to the county commission is what that is. So a recommendation to the county commission that Chris Jones be reappointed um, as the uh, ETJ alternate, um, Roy Pender as the full city, as a full city member, and Kevin Lachlan as a city al alternate member. Is there a second? Second by Alderman Davis. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. I want to thank everyone who did apply to the uh, planning board and uh, continue to uh, volunteer for our city and, and continue uh, applying. And I want to thank those that were chosen. So all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Appointments uh, carried unanimously. Thank you. And uh, again, thank all who uh, applied. Item I, managers, oh, one thing, uh, Dorothy Dutton needs to uh, make a comment uh, concerning one of the agenda items. Yes, I just wanted to clarify because I have many projects in my head right now. The um, bid that we were accepting for, um, is for Kingsley Park, not the city dock. So that Kingsley Park has been in need of repair for a long time. Thank you, yes, that we have that on our. I think I confused you when I said that he did city dock. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And it's on our agenda as Kingsley Park, so we're good. Uh, item I, manager's report. Uh, yes, I have a few quick items. I'd like to thank uh, Randy Jones, police, fire, EMS for the successful weekend last weekend, even though Mother Nature poured buckets on Saturday. I, Friday, I guess, was packed, so, you know, it was an excellent event. Um, anniversaries, I always like to make sure our employees are um, acknowledged. And so we have uh, Mr. Harlan Piles, who's the facilities maintenance specialist, 12 years. Addison White, grounds maintenance, nine years. George Ball, five years, youth basketball head referee. William Wade, who's one of our police sergeants, three years. Kylie Barefoot as the building inspector, two years. Anna Silva Maldonado, volunteer EMS for two years. McGill Howard, one year as a police officer. And Donna Dawson, one year as the community building facilitator. Um, and the only other thing is I just checked the weather and no, we will not be doing the signage tomorrow because <laughs> it's gonna start raining and pouring tonight and going through the majority. So it'll be a Monday project if mother nature agrees, so. That's all I have, Matt. Thank you, City Manager, and thank you for this evening. Um, committee reports, uh, Alderman Allen? Uh, none, thank you. Uh, Alderman Carroll? None. Alderman Alt? Uh, this coming Wednesday, we do the field trip to Wilson for the electrical co-op, um, uh, I guess it's a quarterly meeting, and we'll probably be discussing that bill out there that's going to do a study on 
who's going to provide power in the state of North Carolina? Are they going to expand it beyond Duke? And are, who's going to manage all of that? There's a bill uh, before the, the legislature right now, so I'm sure that's going to be a point of, of uh, contention. Thank you. Um, Alderman Davis. Uh, for forestry, uh, Arbor Day, Arbor Day, Arbor Day, it's on Friday the 28th, starts at noon. There's a really good speaker, and th it's worth your time. Come down there. And if you don't care about trees, there will be free ice cream, right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Eat an ice cream cone, save a tree. Um, but forestry will also be at Nature Fest the next day, and we'll have a table with lots of information about trees, about the tree ordinance, tree permits, everything you want to know about a tree. Somebody besides me will answer your question. Thank you. Alderman Lombardi. Yep, beautification. We had a busy cleanup. Uh, we painted the jail signs prior to the year's opening. And uh, we painted that sign. We painted three signs at uh, Old Smithfield Burying Grounds and also the John Smith Cemetery. Uh, two signs on the Marsh Walk were repaired and repainted. Weeding was done at the Roundabout, Community Building, Garrison Lawn Beds, and at the Pollinator Garden. So we had a busy cleanup. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Marcella. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just want to remind everyone that the planning board uh, regular meeting is next Thursday at 6 p.m. here in the community building. And I hope everybody uh, is starting to enjoy Taylor Field Park. It's now open for business. Thank you. Um, ABC board met um, last night, an excellent meeting. Um, everyone, we had 100% uh, attendance. And um, they're almost done with the, uh, with the building, getting the new door, the windows in. Um, they're doing a the, uh, summer conference for uh, any board members and, and for the manager. So they're, um, they're moving right along. They, um, percentage-wise, their retail sales were up um, almost 10%, um, and mixed beverage, 16%. So this uh, store is booming, they're doing a good job. Uh, if anyone saw me coming out of the ABC store this morning at uh, around 8.30, I, I was not starting early or anything. We, we had a meeting down there. And in the, in the um, it was really an excellent meeting. We all, the board met, uh, all the, em the employees, uh, and um, Mr. William Davis, the chairman, ran the, um, ran the little short meeting that we had and so it gave the employees time to meet the new board members and um, it was just it was it was excellent it was um, so we're, we're, we're moving forward with ABC board and I appreciate this board and their uh, guidance in that regard um, mayor's comments I'll be extremely brief uh, Southport unity committee um, they had uh, a, an event this past Saturday, and they had a cookout, and all the children and families there at that time. It was just wonderful in Kingsley Park. And um, Alderman Carroll appreciate this. One of the um, the kids that I knew in elementary school had his little baby down there, so it, so it uh, uh, just like I was one of the ones that helped deliver ice in the alley, you know, in Southport. So um, it was wonderful seeing Trey's um, granddaughter. And the uh, Unity uh, Committee, um, Southport Unity Committee this Saturday has a festival in Cabinets Park. So please come down. They will have uh, food vendors and also shopping, and that's from noon to 5. Um, also uh, note our budget workshop workshops coming up April 21st, 24th. Um, this is National Library Week coming up, the 23rd to the 29th, and I'm wearing this bow tie for uh, World Autism Awareness Month in April. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for an excellent meeting today and um, the participation of our citizens, the board, our city staff, thank you. And um, we continue to move forward. This was a heavy agenda, and we, um, we went through it with, I think, great grace. So thank you. Um, the staff reports are you know, in your packet. Uh, board comments, Alderman Allen. Thank, 
Thank you, Mayor. Just real briefly, I want to, um, in regards to the bills that have been coming down from Raleigh, I want to um, point out that, well, first of all, I want to thank the mayor and, and the rest of the board for, for his leadership and, and every other alderman's leadership on getting those um, bills out known to the public and asking for their assistance um, in letting our legislators know that uh, we are not in favor of them. Um, I think the reality is the um, General Assembly doesn't care a whole lot about what the city of Southport or, or frankly any other board of aldermen or city council really cares about, but they, they do care what the voters think about. And it's really, it's frankly more important for the citizens to contact the General Assembly and let them know what they're thinking. And, and not only here locally, but you know, and, uh, tell all your friends and family wherever they live to contact their legislators because we really need to, to make sure that all of them hear the voice um, of the people that don't want this to happen. Um, so, and then uh, just coming up on the budget, I just remind everybody we've got um, budget um, meetings scheduled, was it the 21st and 24th, I believe, coming up. So I'd encourage citizens to, um, you know, stay, pay attention to those if you can attend or um, get information on them from us. We'll be happy to talk to you. So thank you. Alderman Alt. Yeah, I want to follow up on what uh, Alderman Allen was talking about. He's absolutely correct that the citizens' input, um, we are seven people here. We have seven votes when it comes to Raleigh. You have a gazillion votes out there. And it truly was the citizens that had a great sway in the getting 317 parked. Uh, when uh, the person in Raleigh called me, uh, because it was Monday, last Monday, they told me that it had been parked and they asked me, would you please spread the word and have your people stop calling us because we're, o this is their words, we're overwhelmed. That is a great thing. Uh, and it's, it's a tribute uh, to the, the citizens. Here's a bill 537, pretty much hot off the press. 537, if I'm reading it correctly, they can now build, if they pass this, anything on Howe Street all the way out to wherever 211 ends, um, you can build probably a 15, 20 story building, call it condos and make it workforce housing. All zoning reference to that in all those districts from the, end, from the waterfront all the way out, every one of those uh, is designated in here and basically all hands, everything's off the books. So this is another one we need to look at very carefully. Um, reference to workforce housing, I'm, I'm not the brightest guy in the world on that topic, so I took the opportunity to meet with the director of Habitat for the Humanity the other day. We stood on a piece of land that's under consideration that happens to be in South Fork. Whether that land and the developer and Habitat can work that out, that's up to them. Uh, one of the issues about having it actually workforce housing in South Fork is the cost of a piece of land. There's a piece of land near me. Uh, it's often very wet. Uh, it's not an acre, and it went for $200,000. Well, you can't mechanically use a $400,000 an acre lot and put workforce housing on it and then be able to turn it into that. So the issue may be we may have to work with the county. We may have to show the legislatures be between now and next session that we are working to figure out collectively how we put workforce housing someplace where people can drive into, uh, into Southport and work here. And, and I think all the municipalities are gonna have to do that. If, these, if we're successful this year in po postponing this, we're gonna need to have, uh, have some action taken in the next year. So I'm going to um, uh, work with the manager to have her meet uh, Carlos, who's the director, and figure out whether or not there's an opportunity to train all of us about how this all works mechanically, the math that goes into this, so we can all speak from the same 
level of knowledge on how it may be able to be either feasible, not feasible, where we go forward on that. Thank you. Thank you. City Manager has an announcement. There was just one thing I forgot, that we have a symposium on Monday, and it's at 2 o'clock, and I bet you it's our most popular one, and that is for Development Services Department to be talking to the public and educating you about what that department does. And if you're going to go, sign up quick, because I'll bet you it'll be a sellout. So it's uh, here in this building, 2 to 4, uh, Monday. Thank you. And ice cream will be available, yeah. Um, Alderman Davis. Thank you. Uh, about those bills that are uh, moving through the legislature, you know, politicians count on the possibility or the likelihood, they think, that voters have short memories. Well, there are four of us sitting up here right now who are proof that at least in Southport, voters have long memories. We were elected because people remembered what the previous board had done. Now, on another completely other topic, 10 miles an hour speed limit, I would like to ask right now that we put that on the agenda for the uh, May meeting. And I, bel I, you know, I, I can't remember an issue about speed limits coming up, at least not in my time here. Do we need a public hearing on a speed limit change? I don't know. Do we? It's in the, it's a regular, I don't think that would be in the UDA. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask that we have that on the agenda at the next meeting because, and for Yacht Bays and Drive and the, the whole square that um, is the perimeter of Yacht Basin. And um, I have one other thing. And I, I can't tell, is the Port Pilot reporter here? No, Elliot. If you didn't read the Port Pilot this week, please do. There is a riveting story, and it's a testimony to really good writing. It's about Pearl the runaway pig in Boiling Spring Lakes, and the, the chase that ensued how the entire community just about got together and how Pearl eluded them for days and days. Meanwhile, her twin sister was pining away because she had run away. Uh, he made it come alive. I can see it in the future as a Disney story, a, a Disney movie maybe, Pearl the Runaway Pig. Don't miss it. Thank you, Alderman Lombardi. Yeah, I just want to repeat basically what everybody else said. When we were up in Raleigh, we were told that the day before they were inundated with calls only from Southport. So that was great. Yes. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Mosteller. Um, a couple of things. Since we were there, they've now added some new bills. Um, uh, Alderman Alt spoke of one. SB 667 um, is it's termed regulation of short-term rentals. Well, what it is is to stop us from being able to regulate. If that bill, you cannot make this up. If that bill passed and got adopted, then uh, we would not be able to enforce our ordinance. So. Uh, for those of you who fought really hard to get um, short -term, a short-term rental ordinance to protect our neighborhoods and the integrity of our community, um, and so that we remain not, not a beach rental community, this is a particularly onerous bill um, and uh, compliments of the North Carolina Realtors Association <laughs> and Airbnb. Um, there's also a bill, SB 675, it's, it, it says land use clarification and changes. This would do away with the ETJ. That's the one that I think Alderman Alt, you already spoke of that one, but that's, a, that's an important one to do, to talk about because w 
our our city limits meanders you know famous isn't in our city limits it's actually in the etj so our that corner that would be the entry to our town would be not under our ordinance uh, our udo it would be the counties which is a much different thing um some of the ones coming even in town the trailer park is county even though it's in our what most people think most people think we go all the way to the bridge to the canal but we don't so it th this etj losing th this particular bill to do away with all etj would be particularly egregious for our community so um if anybody has any questions our planning department has uh, and uh, call any of us. We're all involved with it and still engaging. I spoke with both of our, or communicated with both of our representatives all today, just like other members on the board have. So um, it, we're a work in progress on this. And so uh, keep calling. I would ask you to keep calling and, and, sp and specifically talk about some of these bills as well. Uh, Alderman Ogg, you had uh, further comments? Yeah, just as this is just pointing out, there was a conversation uh, with the landowner at the piece of land when you first come into town on the left-hand side, it, you, it, you've seen some tree cutting there because of the 211 expansion. Uh, you know, in the past we've talked about putting stores in there and all kinds of stuff. For some period of time, there's gonna be a, uh, a temporary water retention pond thing there. Uh, it's not gonna be a permanent thing. Uh, as I understand it to be. Um, uh, but I, if you saw it going in, I, just so you know that it's happening. It has something to do with, with the uh, 211 expansion and the road expansion going out on, on uh, 87. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, yes. Uh, uh, Carol. A few times this evening we've heard these bills associated with the uh, Realtors Association. Uh, I'd just like to take a moment and say that not all Realtors are created equal, and so we don't all support this type of uh, legislation. Uh, in fact, I'm grossly opposed to it. I think it's just not the right thing for our community. So it's not just about making money, and it's not just about selling homes. It's about where we live. Thank you. Excellent comment. Uh, Alderman Carroll. So um, this has been an excellent meeting. Um, we promote local authority for our municipalities and we continue to talk to our legislators and we call Raleigh and appreciate the voice of the people. We hear you, they hear you. Um, I continue to work with the mayors and we'll, we will continue to grow that number um, that contacts Raleigh in terms of mayors and uh, hopefully other boards. So I will, uh, Wish you all a good evening and excellent meeting. We move forward um, every day in Southport, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I believe that was uh, a, a unanimous motion. All in favor? Okay, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you so much, board. Thank you, citizens.